bit because this is Elm Grove. All of us look good. Come on, come on, come on. But we're talking about spiritually speaking. It's, it's an appropriate discussion to have this morning because we, we were talking about celebrating a 90-year presence here in the kingdom, here on this earth as the body of Christ. And I've heard throughout my entire life, the elders say, time brings on change. And this, this, I believe that this is because with time comes activity. And so we get involved and engaged in events and we get engaged in actions that force our focus from what initially may have begun as priority. And so given enough time and activity, we change. I posit this is why some things have happened in our history as a nation and as individuals uh, because of this change that occur due to time and activity. For instance, I, I believe this is why some folk who wouldn't dare walk the street with Dr. King in 1963, in 2015, time, activity, they now recall themselves being his right hand in all things regarding the planning and executing nonviolent civil protests. Yet time and activity has romanticized their recollection. I, I believe that this is why our country continues to have a crisis of, of conscience, if, if not a complete split personality, because I recall when we wanted Elian Gonzalez from Cuba to stay and fought for him to stay. But the same country turned away boatloads of children from Haiti. I, I remember some, some 300 years ago, we sent ships across the Atlantic to the Ivory Coast, to the continent of Africa to get laborers. But in 2015, we want electrified fences and armed guards to patrol the border between US and Mexico to keep them from entering the workforce here. Time and activity sure brings on change. I believe this is why some of us get fooled the same way all of the time. Uh-huh. Because you had the one. Uh-huh. But time and activity, you kept comparing him or her to another one from years back who in truth existed only in your mind because time and activity kind of colored, recolored, uncolored what he or she really was way back then. And so right now you can't see what's in front of you because you're remembering what never really was. Yeah, time and activity brings on change. So I submit then that time and activity can erode our focus. It can, it can shift our purpose. It can change our orientation. And I know that it happens even in the church. See, I know that there are people in our congregation who have been saved for longer than some of us have been alive. But, but every now and then, I'll bet you that you can hear them singing that old hymn. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where, where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Oh, for a closer walk. Ah, 90 years is a long time, church. That's why I must ask the question this morning, Elm Grove. Are you still sharp? I mean, do you still have your, your cutting edge? 
because you know that a cutting edge is literally a, a sharp object that is used to cut through things but it can become dull for two reasons it can become dull because of inactivity or it can become dull because of overactivity if you don't use it enough time and the elements and in the environment will change its composition and make it dull but on the other hand if you just use it over and over again without paying attention to its condition while you are using it it will become dull when you become dull you lose your creativity when you become dull you, you lose your joy when you become dull, you lose your effectiveness. But I have good news for you. You can recover your cutting edge. You can be sharpened again. And that's what we find in our text this morning. The account that we are looking at this morning takes place in the 8th century before Christ, during the time of the king. When Israel was split into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And after the prophet Elijah was taken away into heaven in a fiery chariot, the prophet Elisha began his ministry. Elisha had trained under Elijah for 50 years to prepare him for this ministry. And so Elisha is now training other young prophets of God. That's what's meant by that phrase. And in verse 1 there, the sons of great for us. In other words, the place where we have been staying, the place where we have been studying, the place where we have been growing is getting too small. It can no longer comfortably accommodate or meet the needs of the number of us who are working for the Lord and who desire to study his word. I got to tell you, that was shout news for me right there. A, a, a place dedicated to teaching the word of God to the people has gotten too small to accommodate the number of people who want to come and learn more about the Lord so they can do more for the Lord so they can keep growing in the Lord so they can multiply the things of the kingdom for the Lord the place has gotten too small we have outgrown this building. <laughs> Got to tell you though, there, there's two things that I know uh, about growth. First of all, anything that moves will cause friction. Growth will always cause problems. The second thing I know is that anything that doesn't move and breathe is dead. And so I would sure enough rather suffer growing pains than be dead. <laughs> so we got a growing school of ministry that's happening here. But I, I like these people because not only do they identify a problem, they also come with a solution. And so there in verse number two, it simply reads, let us go, we pray, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. In other words, the prophets requested permission of Elijah to build additional space at the Jordan River. They didn't just go and get the work done. They didn't just decide, well, we can do this ourselves. We don't have to talk to Elisha about it. They, they, they knew there was a problem, but they came with 
him, the man of God, for the solution. They requested the blessing of the man of God put in charge of them. I also want to note that they did not plan to hire contractors to do the work. I didn't read that in the text. What I did read in the text was that they themselves planned to construct the buildings for the school. They knew that building projects required hard work and sacrifice, but they were willing to make whatever adjustments necessary to be sure that they could continue to grow. And perhaps because uh, he had already seen the need, and they didn't attempt to usurp the authority of the one in charge, Elisha granted them their request. One of them said, according to verse 3, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he said, I'll go. In other words, one young man spoke up because he knew at one time that Elisha was a of another man of God, Elisha. And he knew that Elisha had witnessed Elisha watch God perform miracles through Elisha. And so as this young man watches the man of God, Elisha, as he walked with God and he watched God perform miracles through Elisha, just as he knew that Elisha had watched God perform miracles through Elijah, the man made an intelligent, reasonable conclusion that when Elijah or Elisha are around, God moves. And so in essence, what he has said is that, Elisha, we want you to be with us while we work on this building project. We are willing to work for you, but we will not work without you. Because what we understand is that with you comes the presence of God. And anytime there is going to be growth among God's people, the presence of God must be in the place. So Elisha, as the one responsible for us, as the one in authority over us, as the one with whom the presence of God moves, you've got to be on the scene with us. Elijah listened to that and he said, all right, I'm with you. I'll go. So he went with them and when they came to Jordan, they cut down According to verse 4, it's, it's a clear picture to me of, of hard labor. And, and this, these are some industrious workers. Everybody is working. Because he said every man is going to have his own beam. Everybody has something. Everybody is working on God's business. Everybody has come together in this one place for this one purpose of building God's work. Everybody is in one place on one accord working for God's business. Everybody has come to place for the single purpose of doing work that will glorify God, that will multiply his works in the kingdom. Nobody is saying I work more than he worked and so therefore you're going to give me a little more. Did you write? Did you spell my name right? Because I know you're going to have some kind of plaque on the wall. I want to make sure my name, and nobody asked about that. Everybody came together working for the purpose of building God's kingdom. But immediately, I told you there's going to be some problems anytime you have a building project for the Lord. Immediately while working on God's business, a problem arose. Right there in verse number five. It simply reads, as, as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. I'm working as diligently as I know how. 
I am chopping wood as fast as I can. I, I'm doing everything that I can to do my part in, in this. I put my all into it. But, but, but in the middle of my working, my axe head falls off. And I realize I've lost my power. I lost my power. And I didn't lose my power while I was out there in the world. I lost my power while I was working diligently on kingdom business. I didn't lose my power while I was visiting at the duck off. I lost my power while I was building the New Elm Grove Baptist Church. I, I, I lost my power. And my axe said, it, it didn't just fall off into a bush. Because had it just fallen off into a bush, I could have turned around and picked that up. But that sucker fell in the water. And, and you know that the, the axe head is made of iron. So it fell straight. <laughs> Have you ever been working on, on something and things got so bad that you got so deep into something you couldn't get yourself out of it? You, you couldn't see how in the world am, am, am I going to get myself out of this? In the midst of my building project, things went down. In the midst of me trying to rebuild my relationships, things went down. In the midst of me trying to figure out how to keep making it on this job I can't stand coming to every day, things went down down in the midst of me trying to lead this group of people in my ministry that I'm only a volunteer myself trying to do I keep watching things go down and with these children I keep working with every day act like they don't hear nothing that I'm saying it looks like that things just keep going I keep trying to count every penny I keep trying to count everything. I keep it in the ledger in my checkbook, but it seems like things just keep going. Mm. Doesn't appear that there is any human means or way to recover it. But I find encouragement in the way that he handles the situation. First of all, I can, I'd like to note what he did not do. What he did not do was call for a strategy conference on how to make our handles more effective. He, he did not pay for leadership development. On, on how to improve our swing. He, he didn't do that. He didn't take a census of the trees. He didn't work to motivate the wood choppers or, or declare that this is a day for cutting wood with polished axe handles and send out some charismatic leader to, to march towards the forest because you do know that's what we do in the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This ain't working. We've been batting with axe handles for a long time now but but instead of really identifying the problem we're gonna try to figure out what's wrong with the stuff around the problem instead of looking at the problem it ain't just the church you do it in your life every day stop looking at me like you don't understand what I'm talking about how come I can't keep anybody around who's you gonna ask every friend around stop asking them look at you Stop working with the axe handles. And, and so, so while there then is a lot of noise going on because we will keep on trying, we will beat the heck out of the tree with the axe handle. There will be a lot of noise going on and a nail tree falling. At the end of the day, all you got is a bunch of tired workers with, with, with bad backs and beat up axe 
handles. All because our axe head is dull or completely missing. So I like the way this brother handles this crisis. As soon as he felt the axe handle fly off, he is concerned. It bothers him. He cries out in despair because he knows that he cannot continue until he recovers the axe head. So first of all, it lets me know that he's still dedicated to the work because some of us would say, oh, lost the axe handle. I'll see y'all tomorrow when y'all get another axe. He didn't give up the work. What, what he said was, I've got to find a way to get my axe handle back. He, he became helpless at that moment, but he immediately did the right thing. What he did was he told Elisha what happened. Because the text reads that he said, alas, master, I got something that I got to confess to you. Can I tell you that sinking times are praying times? Uh, this is the first thing that I want to tell you is that when you figure out that you have lost your axe handle, uh, that you have lost your axe and you're just using the handle or, or your axe head is dull, all the first thing that you need to do is cry out to the master. Let, all you have to do is confess to him that, that I've lost it. And that's what he did. He confessed that he lost it. And, and by admitting that it was gone, he was also admitting to the fact that it had become loose while he was working. But he didn't take the time to stop and tighten it because he just kept on working anyway. <laughs> In other words, there's a little bit of neglect on his end. Can I tell you that that's the same way with us? Can I tell you that your axe head isn't just going to fly off for nothing? That it's going to loosen over time? That it is going to get dull over time? But that it is our responsibility to pay attention to the axe head such that you don't lose it, such that it doesn't get lost. And the minute that you see that there is a problem, the, the very minute that you find out mm, this ain't connecting the way that it used to, or huh, this thing ain't chopping down trees like it was, mm, I don't have the power that I used to have. You need to cry out to the master, alas, master, something is wrong with my axe head. Sometimes we get so hooked up and involved in church, in the work of the church, that, that we lose sight of what we do and, and we, lose, we lose sight of the condition of that relationship. And, and when that happens, can I tell you that you got to go back. I remember our elders say you need to go back and get that Holy Ghost power. Ah, he was concerned. Why was he concerned? The axe head was borrowed, according to verse number five. It's, it's a serious situation. He, 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 he called out, he confessed, and, and, and then he comprehended the seriousness of the situation. He was upset because I have lost something that does not belong to me. This, this was just, it was borrowed. I had to borrow this thing to use it, and, and, and it costs a lot of money. Because if it didn't cost a lot of money, I could have bought one for myself. But I had to, I had to borrow this from somebody. I was, I was entrusted with this thing to do this good work. And I've lost it. Here's the message for us. All that we are, all that we have, any gift or any talent, any treasure or any time is borrowed from the Lord. Uh -huh. We have the responsibility of taking care of it. We ought not allow ourselves to become useless. I like the way that Elisha handles this situation as well. He did not say, I told you so. He didn't fuss at him for being irresponsible. Elisha did not say, well, you can't work here no more, so I know the Lord is going to send somebody else. Elijah did not say, well, then go on ahead because you must not have been really wanting to work anyway because otherwise you'd have been paying attention to it all along. Elisha did not scold him. What Elisha did say was, where did it fall? Show me, show me where you were when it, when it fell. 
and and he showed him the place and, and so he, he what he did then was that he went back to the place where it had been lost the young man had to to go back to the place where the axe head had been lost how can you recover your edge how, how can you recover your 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 cutting edge and and get it back you got to go back to the place where you lost it where where were you when you lost yeah, I know somebody might have lost it at the dew drop in. I ain't telling you to go back there. <laughs> I'm saying you need to go back to the to the place that got you to go into the dew drop in. And yeah, everybody in here got something to confess. Stop looking at me like you're holy. Go back to the place where you lost it. Confess it to the master. And I am so glad we serve a master who knows how to recover any situation. <laughs> Most of the time we get ourselves in situations there is no human way possible for us to get out of this mess. And, and that's why we need the, the man of God here. He steps right in and he does something very interesting. Scholars have been debating about this for years. It says that Elisha cut down a stick, cast it in the river, and the iron did swim. <laughs> There's a confrontation with the divine. How do I know? Because he took a stick put the stick in the water and the iron just a stick in the water made iron swim don't you know there's some supernatural stuff happening there because in, in, in the natural what happens is in the natural I can put apple seeds in the ground and then the apples will come up in, in the natural I can put lemon seeds in the ground and lemons will come up but he put a stick in the water and iron came up not floating but swimming I gotta tell you that what 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 really gets me about this supernatural occurrence is that this tells our story of salvation yeah. because you see like the axe head we were lost I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more I, I, I was the axe we, we, we were lost and, and, and then in the text the place where the, the axe head was lost was the Jordan River and the Jordan River in the scripture is, is a symbol of death because you do know that the wages of sin is death and so there I was just, just, just sinking in, in death and so as the axe head was lost in death we were dead in trespasses and in sin and so then Elisha cut down the tree and cast it into the water to recover the axe head. He cut down the tree, cast it into the water to recover the axe head. And so I then preach Christ crucified to you. I cast into the river of death called humanity the cross of Christ. And by the blessings of God's spirit upon the gospel, as the axe head was made to swim, dead sinners are raised from death to life by the gospel. The iron did not float, it swam. A dead corpse can float. A live person can swim. And that's how it was brought back to life. That's how we were brought back to life. That's how you recover the axe head go to the master and confess and he's already done the work the axe head returned to the 
prophet, the tree went into the water and the iron swam. The power can return. Jesus experienced death. He rose again, ascended into heaven and left the Holy Spirit to comfort us until he returns again. We can have our power restored. We can get our cutting edge back. But he still got to do one more thing. Verse 7 says, Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. You got to take the axe head back. You've got to commit to it. It's swimming, but you, you've got to take it and commit to it. Here is the message to us. Our faith in Christ does not give us life before God life is given by the command of God yet we are commanded of God to take hold on eternal life and the sinner born out of God does just that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ we take hold on eternal life and we take the life that God has given us in Christ so I gotta ask you one more time Elm Grove. after 90 years are you still sharp? Ha have, you been, have you been watching your relationship with the Lord? And you know, each one of us represents the church, so that's really, that's really a personal, individual question. You need to tap yourself on the chest and ask yourself, am I still sharp? <laughs> I, I, have, I, have I been taking care of my relationship with the Lord? I know I wasn't right when when uh, he came and found me because I, I know what I've done, Lord, and Lord, you know what I've done, but I am just so glad that you allowed me to come to you just as I was, weary, worn, and sad. I'm so glad that he's given me a resting place. And so what I've got to do now then is to keep on growing. I gotta keep on sharpening the tools. I've got to keep on cutting down the trees. I've got to keep on building the kingdom. I've got to keep on making places where others can come and be blessed by the Lord. I've got to go out and be a blessing to somebody else. I've got to go out and make a change in my community. I've got to go out and make a change in the world. It's my responsibility. Every day he gives me brand new mercies. So every day I need to show brand new blessings to somebody else. Is anybody else sharp out there? Uh, are you still ready to do the work of the Lord? Are you ready to do more for the Lord? Because I tell you, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I sure want to give him more of me because he keeps giving me more of him. Are you still sharp, my brothers and my sisters? If not, know that you have a way to get right, get back, and get ready for the Lord. God bless you.